Open our Bibles this morning to Matthew, chapter number 28. We'll be reading verses 16 through 20. Pastor Dennis's message this morning is part four in his sermon series entitled, Jesus' Last Days. This morning's message is the unstoppable mission, go, part two. Again, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Please read aloud with me. The words are behind me on the overhead or follow along in your Bibles. Once again, we're in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You may be seated. Keep your Bibles open. You will look at this scripture here this morning. But let me tell you, this unstoppable mission to go into the entire world has three words that we're going to look at in entirety. And they are all-encompassing words, the word all. We can't say those words and really keep them. I will always, but I fail, so I can't say that. I will, I all, all the time I do this. Well, that's not true, is it? I do it many times or maybe most of the time. But when God uses a word like all, he does it And it is true. Now, we're talking about this unstoppable mission, but I want you to begin, and we're going to back up a little bit before we read, because we have an unstoppable mission, but that doesn't mean people are not going to lie. Because they are. 
People are going to lie about us. And they're going to tell stories. And there'll be lies. But with God, it's an unstoppable mission. But the lies are stoppable. Matthew here is going to tell us what the priest... It must have been their worst fear that they could imagine that Jesus, not only did He literally raise from the dead, but it's even that He's perceived rising from the dead. So they have to do something, and they are going to lie. Matthew chapter number 28, verses 11 through 15 says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers, saying, Say, this, say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. And if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money, that's the guards, and they did as they were taught or told, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Talking about lies, but they're stoppable. <laughs> they, these soldiers are going to say, yeah, we were derelict in duty. We went to sleep when we shouldn't have. Boy, there must have been some real worth, some real money given to them to concoct such a lie and to give it. But no doubt Matthew includes it here the circulation of the story is being spread about, and so he puts it in here that the disciples have stolen the body away. But it's remarkable the irony of this part of the story. The part of the story that the priests are doing everything they can to stop the mission of Jesus Christ and failing at every turn. It must have been frustrating for them, doing everything they could, and yet... Every time it working out, not for their benefit, but for the benefit of Jesus Christ. Let me just share with you a couple of the ironies that I just see here. The guards, they were be, supposed to be the ones preventing the resurrection of Jesus and from anyone stealing the body, and yet they were the first witnesses to the religious rulers. What an irony. They were witnesses whether they wanted to be or not. It didn't matter. God used them anyways. The soldiers were in a position to form security. Now they're the greatest security risk to the priests and to the rulers. And they have to have them kept quiet. The religious leaders worked hard to prevent the situation where Jesus' body could be stolen by the disciples. They did everything that they could. And now they are going to tell the story the very story that they said wasn't going to happen and the reason they put the guards there. What irony. Others may tell lies, and if I ask you, has anybody ever told a lie about you? Ah, yes. Oh, we can get mad and we can hold grudges. God doesn't do that. He says, I work all things out for my good. And sometimes it hurts us, and we may not understand it, they may even mean it for our harm. That's what Joseph said, didn't he? He says, you, my brothers who sold me into slavery, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. Someone tells lies about you, they mean it for your harm. God can use it for good. He's in control. How about this last one? This is such a story that everyone involved here should have picked up on it. It was just three days Late, or three days earlier that they were in front of Pilate. And what did they use? They called him a deceiver. They said, why should he be crucified? Because he's a deceiver. Now they are knowingly and willingly deceiving the people. What irony. Stoppable lies and Jesus is going to stop them in their tracks. One person said, well, a lie can get all the way around the world before a, the truth can take one step. And that's may, it may seem that way, that the truth doesn't get heard, but that is not the truth. We have a God that the truth is heard. They did everything they could. They may have been frustrated, but Acts chapter number 6, verse number 7, tells us this mission, and the lies were stopped. Acts 6, 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem, 
greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And not only were a great multitude, but even these rulers and these priests that were part of the lies turned to Jesus Christ. The lies came to a halt. It's an unstoppable mission. An unstoppable mission in Matthew 28, 18. And he says here three alls. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things. And then he says, I am with you always. Now imagine with me a little bit Jesus saying these things. Let's take a little bit of a different context, but I think you can see the similarities. It may be um, the deathbed, and it's um, someone that you really respect. Maybe a mother or a father. Maybe it's a, uh, a, a person that's just of high honor to you, and you are there at their time of death. And you can see they're not going to be long on this earth, just a few minutes. And they have a puzzled look on their face, and they kind of motion you to come close. And will you bend your ear? Will you get close to hear what they have to say? Certainly. Why, movies and, and stories and books are all written about this, isn't it? And they're written about people who have heard this message and then take it as their life's mission thereafter. Well, we bend our ear and we get down close and we hear what is to be said. Will we do that final request. If my father were like that and he had a final request, it's simple. Yes, I would do that. That, that would not be a, a second thought. I, I would do that. And yet it is here, Jesus Christ, minutes away from he's going to go up to heaven, yet he gives us his last words. He draws you close and he draws me close. And he says, all, in verse number 18, and he spake unto them, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. He has given it to us. Do we hear it? I told you there's three alls here. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And we talked about that a lot last week, didn't we? We talked about the nations in the world that need Jesus Christ, and we as a congregation, how we take the message to the world. Yet it's clarified in Acts chapter number um, 1, verse number 8, how we are to take this message. It says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon ye, and ye, uh, you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in, both, it says, in Jerusalem, and Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We look at that, and Jerusalem was where they were living. Judea was the next perimeter. Samaria, like their... Um, state, and to the uttermost part of the earth, to the rest of the world. To take it to the rest of the world, we have to take it here at home to Phoenix, first of all. That's where we have to take it. There is a personal message, a local message, to Thomas Road Baptist Church. Jesus draws us near and says, can you hear me? Will you listen to me? And will you take the message? It begins here. In Acts chapter number 19, we begin to study how Paul took the message and God directed him where to go. At times said, don't go here, but go here. Very specific. And Paul is directed by God to go to Ephesus. He goes to a large city. In fact, he is directed by God to go to city, to city, to city. Everyone needs the gospel, but Paul went to the city. Why did God have him go to the city? I believe there are some specific reasons we can just begin to understand. The cities are collection plates, uh, points. There are places where people come together. In Ephesus, was, was a huge city at the time, around 300,000 people. A collection point. It's where the majority of people live that need the Savior. 
Now you say, well, why do people live in the city? I don't know, but they do, don't they? The majority of the people live in Phoenix. The majority of people that live throughout the state of Arizona, more than half of the state, live right here. It's a collection point. God knew that, and God sent Paul right into the middle where the people were. Not only that, God knew that the cities have functions. They do certain things. Um, the cities act as an amplification. What happens in the city is amplified throughout the rest of the country. Here in Arizona, what happens in Phoenix is amplified throughout the rest of our state. We don't know the news of Baghdad. We just don't. We don't know um, in Cottonwood the, the latest and the biggest news of Cottonwood, but we, the rest of the state knows the biggest news of Phoenix. It acts as an amplification system. And God is directed by Paul to the cities because he knew his message would be amplified from the city. But not only that, the cities are distribution centers. Many look at the city as a negative, terrible, crime-ridden place. And yeah, that may be true, sure. But it's only true because there are more sinners per square inch. There's more sin per square inch. There's more pain per square inch in the city than anywhere else. But that's why God sent Paul to the city. More people needed the gospel. There were more people in pain in the city. And Paul was directed to go there. When the gospel was set up in the city, it was distributed from the city and taken to the rest of the world. Let me back up if you're struggling with this and thinking this through in your mind. Education, business, sports, economics, um, entertainment, culture, all flows from the city, doesn't it? We understand that, and God knew it also. But God didn't stop the sewage that was flowing from the city to the rest of the areas. i got to say, God's ways are different than my ways. His ways um, are not my ways. Why, I... Stop the bad and put the good in. But God doesn't do that. He puts the gospel in the pipes flowing out of the cities. The good news, the hope and the healing. And it flows out of the cities to everyone. God knew that. And He had a plan in doing that. The city is important to what God does. You and I are important to what God does. Let me say, I understand we live in the city. And I understand we can say it's terrible in the city. Some people could say, well, pastor, you can't do ministry in the city like that anymore. I say hogwash. I say just as Paul was sent right to the heart of the city where, the heart, where there was more sin per square inch, God's light shines the brightest where it's darkest. And God has placed us in the city. The Great Commission is motivated. It's internally focused mindset. If you have a great commission mindset, an internally focused mindset, it's a risky life. Pastor, what do you mean? It means it's risky because you're going to live on less because you are going to give. It means that you're going to invite people over to your home that are different from you. You are going to spend time with people and go places in the city you would not go otherwise, but you go there because you're great commission motivated and eternally focused. That's what motivates us. That's when God says, all power is given unto me. And he says that, go ye therefore and teach all nations, beginning with our Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem is right here around us. Your Jerusalem is those neighbors around you. And those that don't know Christ are our Jerusalem, and we are called to go to them. You ought to be able to right now think of at least one person that you are praying about every day that God would help you bring to Jesus Christ. It's our Jerusalem. That's the people that we can reach. I've been having an opportunity, and not just one, but a couple. And it's not been one year, but multiple years. And as I get to know them better and in their business, 
I will encourage you to go to that person. But when I in, in say, oh, this person has this business, you could go over there and it would meet your needs. But I will always share with you, if you go over there, um, this person, person that I'm praying about, and you, please somehow leave them a gospel track, share the gospel with them, invite them to church, let them know what's number one and most important in your life. There ought to be someone, and we're encouraging one another to meet these people where they are. It is so important. A lady came up to D.L. Moody, and she told D.L. Moody, I don't like the way you share the gospel. D.L. Moody goes, you know what? I don't like it sometimes either. How do you share the gospel? She goes, well, well I don't really have a plan. D.L. Moody goes, well, then I like my plan a whole lot better. You know what? I mess up sometimes. I don't do it right. But we've got to have a plan. We've got to have someone we're praying for in our Jerusalem that we are motivated to win for Jesus Christ. Then he goes on and says, Observe all things. Here, Jesus gives his disciples the charge, and it's the same charge that our church family in 2012 is still living out today. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This mission involves some elements, some different elements, doesn't it? There is evangelism and discipleship. They're kind of one word. I guess we could call it discipleship. But you've got to have that first element of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. It, Jesus has charged His followers to simply make duplicates of ourselves. That's all he, he's saying right there. The Great Commission is a discipleship mission where teaching and truth produces people who are changed like us. Changed people. Um, the starting point of Christianity is not you know, going to church. It's not just all these other things we could say. The starting point is right here. It's not a higher level of maturity. The starting point of Christianity is discipling and evangelizing others who do not know Jesus Christ. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, and this is your first week of knowing Christ as your Savior, your starting point is to tell how Christ has changed your life with someone else this week. If you've been saved for 50 weeks, the challenge and the um, commission here by Jesus Christ is still the same. I want to share this story. We shared it in my um, Bible fellowship class, and I hope you are praying for one another and sharing praises. Um, ben Elliott um, was sharing with me how, oh, several weeks ago, his daughter Brooke, who's four years old, said, Dad, you know, I don't know Christ as my Savior. I need to be saved. And Dad's it's all good dads and parents. You want your son or daughter to understand salvation. You know, she's four. Can she really understand this? Is, is this possible? And Ben talked to her a little while and then put her off. Well, Brooke wasn't done. And as best she could, she went to her seven-year-old cousin and she said, you need to know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And began to tell her about Jesus and what she knew. And um, Anita and Ben got involved. And... Last week, Brooke and their seven-year-old, um, Brooke's seven-year-old cousin, came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. Amen. That's exciting. And you know what? Ben said, we spent about 45 minutes. I wanted them to understand all these kind of things. But Brooke was carrying out the Great Commission. Maybe she was saved even before Ben sat down and prayed with her. I don't know. God could have done, you know, Brooke could have understood it from teaching and um, hearing the gospel and already prayed and had it in her heart or whether she got it. But you know what? She knew what she wanted to do and she wanted Jesus Christ as her Savior. That's so encouraging. That's so exciting. That ought to be in our heart and in our life. When we know Christ as our Savior, we want others to to know Christ as our Savior. Our mission is to make other people who are radically committed followers of Jesus Christ. And that ought to be us. We are radically committed. We would do anything for the cause of Christ. Like Jim and Laura, we would leave family, we would leave country, and go to Moscow. We are radically committed to Jesus Christ. And that is the call for you and I. 
But your call may not be to go to Moscow, but we're so radically committed to Jesus Christ. We are to do what Jesus has done in us. But what does it look like? He gives us two examples here. First of all, there's the act by whereby we publicly identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We call that baptism, don't we? It's not a part of salvation. This morning, if you say, I understand a lot, but I've never been saved, salvation is when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for our sins. Baptism is not that. It's an identification with Jesus Christ. It publicly tells everyone else why Jesus is who I trust as my Savior. He has forgiven my sins. It's a symbol. Not unlike the symbols that we give away at wedding. We give away a wedding ring. And, and um, a husband and a wife, they give each other rings to wear always as a symbol of their love and true commitment to them and to them only. This morning, that's a first step of obedience. It's the step that says, I am committed to Jesus Christ and to Him and Him only. And we, we follow the Lord in baptism. I've been talking with some and... Um, even this last week, that want to be baptized, have come to know Jesus Christ, and want others to know that they are committed to Jesus Christ. Why? That's our commitment. Then it says teaching people. Teaching, though, here, why our educational system is teaching to a test, or teaching to learning, or teaching to trivia. They teach to a test in school so that you can learn what you need to know so you can pass the test. Okay, I did that for a long time and so I could get an A. Maybe you guys did that too. Maybe you were taught so that you could just have knowledge and then you had lots of knowledge and you could win on Trivia Pursuit and all the trivial games. And you just had all this knowledge. That is not the teaching here. Why is it? It's not to accumulate content. This learning's goal is teaching them to observe. True discipleship is teaching people how to obey. How to obey. And if you learn and sit here in church but do not obey, that's not correct teaching. When we're in class, we learn something and then we go, I have got to change. What does God want to do? He wants to change me every day. And I don't want to change sometimes. I like the way who I am. I like the way I do things. And God says, no, change. You need to be more like me. That's sinful. Get it out of your life. Sometimes it's just not necessary. Get it out of your life. So in baptism, we obey, don't we? We say the first act of teaching, say I will obey and I am baptized. I will not disobey. So my goal in life is transformation. The teaching transforms my life. Go, going here is not just an activity. It's a mindset. It's my philosophy of life. It's how I'm going to live my life. Therefore, every single follower of Jesus Christ is a disciple-making, gospel-spreading person. It's our duty. It's what we do. It's not just something that we um, want to do, but it's who we are. The fight that we will always fight is to, well, I don't do it, and I assimilate into the culture. I look more like the world. I blend in. I act like. I spend like. I'm just like everyone else in my neighborhood. God says, no, I want you to be different. I want to change you from everyone different in your class. And at some point, your neighbors ought to go, you're different. Yes, you're different. On Sunday mornings, you get up and go to church. And then they go, you're different on Monday. You're different on Tuesday. You just hit your thumb with a hammer. And you didn't curse God. You didn't tell everybody how you hate everything in the world and how that's the world. You, you didn't do that. How come? Because God has changed you. Yesterday, maybe you read, um, Chuck Colson um, passed away. Chuck Colson, for our... Many of us came on the scene as a household name during the, probably the, at least in our lifetime, the greatest and worst political scandal, and he was right at the heart of it, doing 
the worst that could be done. That was Chuck Colson. Yet today, I was just reading a little bit, and I, I read some words that were given about Chuck Colson in his life, and I think it has to do with this life that is transformed, that is radically different than what it was before. Here's the house speaker, John Bonner. He says, Chuck Colson lived an extraordinary life. He was a man. Now, you've got to remember, now, he's passed away. We're going to say good things. But beyond that, let's, let's get to words. He was a man who experienced tremendous lows, yet went on to spark a movement of ideas, and people focused on spiritual transformation. I don't know if the Speaker of the House is a believer, but he knew what Colson was after. Colson wanted people to be different than they were before. That's what Colson's life was all about. Billy Graham had something to say. He says, for 35 years, Chuck Colson, a former prisoner himself, because at Watergate, if you don't remember, he went to prison, and that's where his life got changed. A former prisoner himself had had a tremendous ministry reaching into prisons and jails and saving, uh, um, with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. When I get to heaven and see Chuck again, I believe I will see many, many people whose lives have been transformed because of the message he shared with them. Chuck Colson transformed some lives because of his message. I don't know this person, um, but I think this person, Michael um, Camarte, Vice President of Ethics and Public Policy Center, I don't know who he is, but I think he, if Chuck Colson could have written something about his life, I think he would have liked this. I think this had to be somebody that knew him really well. It says, he played political hardball for keeps. That would have been him. He was ruthless. He wanted to win at all costs. And he had a reputation as a person who wanted to win at all costs. And it ended up his life at Watergate scandal and ultimately at prison with that. Then he goes on and says, I think, though, if he's going to be remembered for anything... He's going to be remembered as a person who had a complete turnaround in his life. He met Jesus and was transformed. That's what we're talking about. In each of our lives, we ought to be radically transformed. Observe. And then he goes on that we're to keep on going. We're to, God has given us life, so we're to keep on going. He says, I am with you, and the word is always. I'm with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Lord knows what we're like. Man, I want to do so much right, and yet, man, when I know myself, I don't. Even here on the mountain, verse number 17, it says some were doubting. And so what does he do? He gives us a promise. God knows that we are weak, that we're prone to fear, distractions, and even quitting. Yet, God now doesn't leave us with the last all, with a command, but with a promise. Mark this one down. If you don't need it today, you'll probably need it this week. Why, this promise is not just a future hope, but it is a present reality. He says, I am with you always. Every moment when you feel uncomfortable, when you're in a situation where you feel stretched, Jesus says, I am with you. It's an empowering presence of Jesus Christ. To take the gospel, He lives within us. We're to go to places that stretch us, things that are different. And so Matthew ends this glorious gospel with not another command, but the promise. The promise of an unstoppable mission. Jesus Christ lives within you, and the promise is, I am with you. Hebrews says it again, I will never leave you or forsake you. That way you can't say, I can't do that, Pastor. Pastor, I can't change like that. Pastor, I could never do that. If God wanted me to do that, I can't because it's not true. 
If you will give yourselves to Jesus Christ, if I will give myself to Jesus Christ, I can, and I promise you, He is trying to change you and transform you so that your neighbors can know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And in that transformation, He's not trying to make it comfortable and make your life easy. He's not trying to do that. When sin happens, He wants us to deal with it. He doesn't want us to brush it under the rug so that nobody understands it or so that we can say that they didn't see it. It's a lie. They see the sin in our lives and when they see it, we need to ask forgiveness and we need to ask forgiveness of them too. Sure, don't brush it under. Why, it's so important. I want to bring it and I want you to have a picture. What does this look like? This taking my mission, this command of God, this duty, my life transformation, and putting it into someone else. And I saw this short little video, and I think it paints a picture. Because so many times we can say, Pastor, I'm trying, but I'm not getting anything done. Or I'm trying, but, you know, I'm failing. Or I have tried in the past, but it just didn't work. And so I'm not giving it 100% today. And we need to give it 100%. There's a video right here I want you to watch, just two minutes long, and I believe it'll paint a picture. Hope it'll encourage you this morning. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James. He was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. Let me ask you to bow your head this morning. The mission, that unstoppable mission, the Great Commission is.
for all of us. It was given by Jesus Christ personally. His last breath here on earth, He gives us a command and a promise. Matthew tells it to us. He says, go. And then remember my promise. I will be with you. I will never leave you. Can you see a picture of Nate in your life? Has anyone ever called you up and said 10 years ago, you told me about Jesus Christ and I got saved? You ever heard a story like that? Has God ever used you in a special way? Can you track it? Sometimes you can track it. Sometimes you can't. I'll tell you today, if you'll give out a gospel track today, if you'll tell the story of Jesus Christ today, you'll make a new story. Much better than that video of the strangers because it will be your story. This morning, say, Pastor, really, I'm the one who doesn't know Christ as our Savior. This morning's for you. We're going to have an invitation. It's a morning for you to really look in your heart. What, God, do you want from me? I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to have a word of prayer. And I'm going to have Joel sing just a hymn. We're going to keep our heads bowed and eyes closed. It's our invitation. It's a quiet time. And I invite you to come forward. I invite you just to pray between you and God. Our dear Heavenly Father, may your message impact my life. May I be radically transformed and be a transforming agent of yours. In Jesus' name.